Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'll, it's Peter Dunn here. I'm the Secretary of the Aviation Historical Society of Queensland. I'll uh, now hand over to um, our President, Warwick Henry, to start proceedings. Thank you, Peter. And welcome all to another entertaining presentation from the Aviation Historical Society of Australia. Queensland. Um, no doubt you've all heard the news that the last quarter 747 was flown away today and he did something interesting after taking off, after flying past Wollongong to start with, then he turned northwest, goodness knows what is going on, and then this, he moves. I took this off flight radar this afternoon, the evening rather, so that was taking about oh, an hour ago and he's on his way. That'll go down. I, I saw my Facebook was light, was lit up with we half a dozen different people posting pictures similar to that. Anyway, he's on the way. That's the last 747-400 Aquatus after nearly 50 years of operation of 747s. And at the bottom part of the left, there's a picture there. We went down over Wollongong to Haas to overfly the collection there, which includes Aquatus's first 747-400, which is part of the collection that's down there. Um, Warwick, uh, just a minute. Um, I just need, I forgot to mute everyone. I'll just mute everyone and you may need to unmute yourself then. So I'll just mute all. Um, and now if you could unmute yourself. And I've just unmuted myself. Right, and I'll just unmute um, Baz, hopefully. Uh, Baz, you may need to unmute yourself. Yep. Right, uh, back to you, Warwick. Yeah, just a bit of further. Mm -hmm. Apart from Qantas now getting out of 747s, British Airways announced a few days ago that they are, are retiring their final 34 or whatever it is, similar number of 747s now instead of in three years' time, as they had planned. Uh, that's the main part of that. Tonight we're going to have Baz Kruger. Excuse me if I've mispronounced it. Uh, with your story of locating a lost B-25 and future meetings at the end of this month, Friday week, 31st, we'll have Dave Kingshot from Caboolture area talking about Warburg's restoration. Five, uh, a month later, 28th of August, by Owen Zup, who will be talking about Philip Zup and Life in the Sky. And it's about his father, who was a commando, I'm going to fight a pilot in World War II and Korea. On September, Friday 25th of September, we'll have David Lind Lindsay on searching for SAR, SAR being San Antonio Rose, a B-17 that was lost in uh, what they now call West, uh, West Tyrian, and it was then known as Dutch New Guinea. Um, if any of you is working on a presentation for AHSA, let us know about it. And I'll hand you back now to uh, Secretary uh, Peter to see and introduce Baz properly. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Warwick. Um, <clears throat> just, I'll just go back to this one. Um, Warwick talked about the 747 uh, heading over to America at the moment so it can be parked in the Mojave Desert. Our presenter um, in August, Owen Zup, is actually at the command uh, of that aircraft right at the moment, flying it to America. Mm. Um, so that's our presenter in uh, in August. Ah, I wonder if that, put note of that. I think they must be late leaving Sydney. I thought they were due to leave at 2 p.m. or something. And uh, it must be almost dark by the time they get down to Wollongong, I think. However, they're on their way. Very good. <laughs> right, uh, well, tonight uh, I'd like to introduce Baz Kruger. Ba Baz is located in Holland. Um, I've known Baz for quite a few years now. We've helped each other on and off in regard to Dutch forces that were in Australia during World War II, um, both you know, aviation, um, shipping and, and army forces. Uh, there were quite a few in um, Australia during World War II. And for those, some of you may not know that um, when the Dutch Netherlands East Indies government escaped out of Java, they actually set up their government here in Queensland, in Brisbane, initially in a whole heap of places around Brisbane. But when uh, General Kruger's Sixth Army moved out of Camp Columbia, which became Camp Wacol, they moved to Camp Wacol or Camp Columbia 
and they ran the Netherlands East Indies government from there. But enough of that, um, I'd like to um, introduce Baz. Um, I think Baz, from memory, you were a curator at a Dutch museum. And before you start, I, I, if you could, if you could just um, tell us a little bit about, well, firstly, tell us where you actually live in Holland and then tell us a little bit about yourself and then, then you can um, start your presentation. But just before I do that, I need to stop the share so that you can do the share. So over to you, Baz. Thank you. All right, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm hoping this the, the unmute did work and you all can hear me. Yep. Um, well, I think I first met Peter on email when that still was running on steam power in 1995 or something. <laughs> um, uh, when I worked as a curator for the Dutch Air Force Museum. Uh, and that's where all my interest in um, uh, the, the air war in the Pacific uh, started. Uh, I worked there for 10 years, uh, but I'll uh, talk some, some about that uh, during the presentation. Uh, in 2000, I uh, briefly worked for the Aviodome Museum. Some of you might have heard of it. It was then uh, located at Schiphol Airport, but has now moved to uh, another small airport, Lelystad Airport. Um, I did the move for that museum. Then I worked for 11 years as the director of the Dutch Fortification Museum. So fortifications are not moving, but Dutch fortifications can be found all over the world. So that was a very interesting, uh, interesting time. And in 2015, I decided to start for myself, self-employed in heritage, in museums, um, everything uh, connected to old buildings, reuse of them. And I uh, uh, made it clear that I took some time for my own projects. And that's when the aviation again um, started up. And um, well, that's uh, probably why, why I'm sitting here now uh, uh, talking to you. Uh, I'm, I'm based in uh, Leiden, a uh, university town uh, about 40, 50 kilometers south of Amsterdam. That's where I studied maritime history. Um, and where I'm living now um, again. So um, I think I'll start up the, um, the presentation. Share, share. Let's see if this works. Um, So, uh, Peter, is this, uh, yeah. Yeah, that little black thing. <laughs> now it's gone, now you're right. Now it's gone, okay. It's, it's okay now, but I, yes. I just can't see my presentation, can't see my presentation, so. Um, all right, um, well, uh, this morning for me, it's uh, 11.30 um, in, in Leiden. I'll be talking uh, about a project I've been working on since 2015. But I'll start a little bit uh, earlier on the, um, uh, the experiences I had in the Dutch Air Force Museum. And I also briefly, um, but I'll skip those slides uh, very fast, uh, the, um, the air war in the Pacific. Some of you might know much more about it than I do. I'm, I'm certain that Justin has a lot more knowledge about this than, than I do. But um, uh, for the sake of the whole uh, project and understanding why the bomber was there, um, I'll briefly go through these um, through these slides. Um, well, the, the New Guinea War, uh, from let's say the Dutch perspective, is uh, is interesting because we uh, mostly or even only focus on the uh, post-war colonial times, the 1945-1949 fight uh, for uh, Indonesia. Uh, there's hardly any interest in uh, the, the war period 1941-1942, the, the, the battle for the Indies, or for the period after that 1942-1945, uh, when Dutch units were either based in Australia or in uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Um, so from that perspective, it, it's interesting to, to look at this, uh, this campaign and this battlefield. And 
Um, I don't know how you will look at it, but um, from the more uh, international or even more American perspective, uh, the war in the Pacific is U.S. Marines in Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Saipan, and all those places. And nobody ever heard about uh, Kokoda, Buna, Gona, uh, Vevak, Biak, uh, Morotai. That's completely um, uh, neglected uh, campaign, while it, while it was a, a huge campaign. It was uh, 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 an infantry and uh, an air war campaign, and here I find the two uh, very fitting for the uh, for the ground war, just slogging it out in the mountains or uh, or in the swamps. The air war was of course uh, completely different. Uh, life for pilots on the ground was uh, miserable, but uh, life in the air could be uh, somewhat better. Uh, there are descriptions of uh, of pilots and aircrew flying over beautiful lush green. Uh, a land and, and azure blue oceans, uh, of course, knowing that if they would crash in that land or in that ocean, chances of survival were uh, very, very slight. Um, and I find it interesting in, in that respect that it was completely different from the air war over Europe, uh, which was deadly also, but chances of survival once you uh, survived the crash or uh, bailing out by parachute were uh, immeasurably better than uh, than in the Pacific and certainly in uh, in New Guinea, but we'll be talking about that later. Um, well, I don't have to tell you <laughs> where New Guinea is, but for a, a lot of my uh, the people in in lectures I do here in Holland, uh, I have to explain where where New Guinea is. <coughs> and from uh, this picture, it it is interesting to see. Uh, that it's to um, to the east of uh, the former Dutch East Indies, to the north of Australia, and together with the uh, the, the Solomon Islands, it could be a barrier um, to prevent reinforcements uh, from Australia and America reaching the battlefield. And I think that was the main purpose um, uh, or the main goal why there was a, a fight in New Guinea. Um, New Guinea wasn't mentioned in any of the plans of the Japanese or the Americans before the war. There was no interest uh, in New Guinea altogether. No uh, big cities, no factories, no strategic targets uh, of any importance, just uh, the strategic location. It's the second largest island in the world, but why they would call it second largest while there's such a huge island just south of New Guinea, I don't know. Greenland is is a little bit bigger, but it's it's a huge uh, a huge battlefield. Well, the the, the main characters <coughs> on the American side, of course, uh, uh, MacArthur uh, um, uh, on on the left here in the picture. In in the center, uh, General Walter Kruger. Maybe um, I'm related to him. I haven't found out yet if that's uh, if that's the case. Born in uh, in Prussia. And together with um, MacArthur's uh, intelligence commander, Charles Willoughby, who was also a uh, German by birth, but changed his name. Um, and on the far right, uh, General George Kenny, commander of the 5th Air Force, uh, which I find a very interesting commander, very unconventional um, and a, um, yeah, an in interesting figure to to fight this air war, this, this uh, important air war in, uh, in New Guinea. On the Japanese side, of course, you, you have the well-known Yamamoto, who was the uh, commander of the, uh, the Japanese Navy until he was shot down over the Solomons in 1943 and killed. And on the ground, it was General Adachi, uh, commander of the Japanese 18th Army and all the uh, Japanese Air, uh, Army Air Forces were also under his, uh, his command. Of course, Japanese commanders are far uh, less known than, than uh, US and uh, Australian commanders, but here you have Yamamoto and Adachi. But the New Guinea campaign, uh, th th there's a lot to, to tell you about that. I won't go into that uh, too much. Um, besides, uh, just telling that in, in, in the start, 1942-1943, it was uh, much of an attritional warfare campaign. You can see that on the, the, the dates on the map. Um, 
uh, starting in, in May, June 1942, when the, uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea was fought. Um, and later, uh, the fighting over the Kokoda Trail uh, stopped the Japanese from uh, capturing Port Moresby. And it took almost a full year uh, till the end of 1943 to get uh, that short distance from Milne Bay to uh, Ley and uh, Salamau. Uh, and it cost a lot of blood, um, sweat and tears to get there. And then um, uh, MacArthur decided to uh, more or less change his, his tactics or his strategy uh, better uh, and to go a more or less virtual island hopping. So hopping all those uh, short invasions uh, up to the Philippines and then to uh, Taiwan, Formosa on his way to, um, to Japan. And it was of course virtual island hopping because uh, he uh, landed on mainland New Guinea a, a number of times. Um, and it was different from the, from the real island hopping that the, the US Navy did uh, in, the, in the Central Pacific. Uh, you can see something from the, uh, the, the scale of the campaign in the, in the numbers that are, uh, were uh, deployed there. The Japanese had 300, about 350,000 troops sent to New Guinea, of which more than 200,000 were killed. These, these are huge numbers. Um, uh, 350,000 troops is uh, about the size of the German 6th Army at Stalingrad. So we're talking about uh, not, not a sideshow, but about a, a serious campaign that was fought in, uh, in New Guinea. And, and the Japanese had massive losses there. Um, not so much in combat, uh, but most of them just died there. Uh, starvation, hunger, diseases, lost in the jungle. Some of them might even be eaten by the Papuas or beheaded. Uh, the, the beheading that's known, I um, found a couple of months ago in, in the Dutch archives that we were paying uh, silver guilders for every pair of ears that were delivered to the commanders in, uh, in Biak. And some of the Papuans racked up impressive numbers just to get those, uh, those silver guilders. <coughs> but here you have a picture of the uh, the campaign. Um, uh, what I told you earlier, it was um, uh, mostly jungle combat on the ground. You see, can see the terrain, a lot of swamps and jungles and bushes and, and very, very difficult uh, terrain to fight in. Not much of mechanical warfare, most of it uh, infantry supported by uh, a, a bit of artillery and, uh, and air support. Um, well, uh, the, the, the difference between the two uh, approaches is here. The uh, Central Pacific uh, campaign by Admiral Nimitz, who did the, the real island hopping. And there you see all the, the famous names of Tarawa, Saipan, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, um, and the, um, the New Guinea uh, Philippines campaign of uh, MacArthur uh, to the south. Um, doing those uh, campaigns, uh, they needed a, a couple of things that the Japanese didn't really have or didn't find that important uh, from their combat perspective. Um, of course, it all started with uh, air superiority. Uh, the US Navy did that with the carriers in the Central Pacific and uh, MacArthur did it with the, uh, the Fifth Air Force, Kenny's Fifth Air Force uh, on the ground. They needed, of course, amphibious capacity to, to land all these uh, troops in all, all the places. Uh, combat units to fight whatever Japanese were found on the invasion beaches. Um, but the strategy was to fight them where they ain't. So leave Japanese garrisons behind the lines um, and let them wither on the vine. Uh, deny them of supplies of food, of fuel, of ammunition, of medical supplies and they just sit there. There are no roads in New Guinea. So uh, once troops are at a certain place and you destroy their transport capabilities, they, they cannot leave. Um, and maybe the, the, the most important thing was engineering and logistical capabilities. And in that respect, the allies were um, uh, very much uh, more powerful than, than the Japanese. And, um, 
uh, attached more importance to that uh, aspect of, uh, of warfare. You can uh, compare it with having a, a very sharp bladed sword, uh, and the Japanese had excellent swords, but you can cut off only so many heads before it gets blunt, and then you need logistics to sharpen the blade again. And the Allies had a lot of ways to sharpen their blades again. Um, bringing in um, new supplies, building harbors, building air bases, building huge repair facilities. Um, at a certain point in Hollandia and New Guinea, they had a, a camp of about 20,000 troops with uh, repair facilities, hospitals, uh, cinemas, and even an ice cream uh, factory was in, uh, was in Hollandia. So that difference, uh, the, and the Japanese uh, had more interest in uh, the combat aspects of, uh, of warfare and support forces were not that important to them. Um, well then Kenny and his more or less unconventional approach, as I told you there was no strategic importance and no, no targets of strategic importance in, uh, in New Guinea, no, no big factories like in Germany, no big cities like the RAF uh, bombed in Germany. Um, so he focused much more on, uh, <clears throat> on his tactical uh, uh, air war and using that for the strategic goal of advancing uh, MacArthur's troops. Well, for, for the air superiority, he of course used uh, uh, fighters to, to get the, um, the air clean of, uh, of Japanese fighters, but then to deny them their airfields and to damage their planes on the ground. And, um, uh, impair their uh, possibilities of, of using those air bases. He employed uh, his light and medium bombers as uh, strafers and employed with parafrag, so the uh, small bombs suspended from from a parachute. You can see on the uh, on the right picture, and these were very very effective, um, and they could, uh, when employed well, destroy uh, numerous Japanese. Um, air bases and all the, the planes on them. And in, in that respect, Kenny was the, the right person at the right place in the right time, because he had been um, a, a more tactical uh, um, air man before the war, uh, instead of all the strategic uh, air commanders that the, uh, the US Air Force had and employed in, uh, in Europe. Uh, he knew that there were um, stores of parafrags in, uh, in the US and he asked them to be uh, sent over to the, uh, to the New Guinea campaign to use them and he employed them uh, very well. At sea he used uh, partly the same um, uh, methods by using his strafers in combination with skip bombing and masthead attack. Um, the strafers were either used with their uh, heavy armament of, uh, of 0.50 machine guns to destroy small ships by the machine guns themselves themselves or against heavier uh, warships um, these machine guns uh, made the japanese gunners take cover so they weren't able to uh, to shoot back at the low flying and vulnerable um, uh, allied bombers um, well, skip bombing uh, is like skipping stones over the water, as we all did when we were children, um, and then trying to hit in the skip uh, a, a ship at its, uh, at its side. In the, in the picture on the right, you can see uh, on, on the top a Japanese um, a freighter or tanker that's been hit. Um, and the, the Japanese sub chaser at the bottom, he was very lucky at this moment that the, the bomb skipped just over uh, the ship. You can see the bomb still uh, at, at, the, at the right below the picture in the air. Um, but I think in the, in the next attack, it, uh, the ship was uh, destroyed. Masthead attacks were a little bit more effective as the, uh, the plane flew in the length of the ship, dived down and just before uh, more or less uh, uh, hitting the ship, it, it pulled up and uh, let, let fly the bombs which smashed in the, in the Japanese ship with a, uh, um, a slight delay in the uh, detonation so the, the, the plane could fly away be before it was blown away by its own bomb. 
Uh, and these were very, very effective methods of uh, destroying Jap Japanese shipping. Well, in that respect, uh, the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, uh, and now we're getting to the, the story of the, uh, the, the lost B-25, is that the Japanese tried in March 1943 to get a, a full convoy of, uh, of ships, uh, both freighters and warships, to um, lay. And all of them, uh, except for two destroyers, were, were sunk uh, just by Allied uh, air forces. No Allied warship was involved in this battle. Um, and from that moment on, the Japanese realized that they couldn't sail any convoys of, of big freighters during daylight uh, anymore. It was, they were much too vulnerable against the, um, the Allied air uh, forces. The Japanese then changed over to using smaller barges, smaller shipping uh, to sail during uh, the night and to uh, lay up on, on the coast or in, in coves or uh, the mouth of a river during the daytime camouflaged uh, and hoping not to be found by, uh, by the Allies. Um, and that's where uh, the 5th Air Force really started uh, their barge hunting, so trying to find all these small ships and, uh, and sink them. Um, well, this is one of the impressive uh, pictures of the, the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, where an A-20 attacks a, a Japanese freighter at mast height. So they were trying to win the war, not on the battlefield, but off the battlefield, uh, deny the Japanese any supplies and just let them sit and uh, be in more or less their own prisoner of war camp. They were still dangerous in those camps, but um, they couldn't offensively fight the war again. So here you go, the, the, the landings in Ley in September 1943, um, and then Hollandia, um, April 22, 1944, <coughs> which for us, for the Dutch is interesting because uh, it was the first town uh, in the Kingdom of the Netherlands that was liberated from, uh, from the Axis, not a town in Holland itself. That was um, Maastricht in September 1944 in Operation Market Garden, but Hollandia was uh, half a year earlier. So here again you see the, the, the steps uh, MacArthur took by the, the invasions, so leaving the Japanese in, the, uh, in their garrisons in Rabal, in Bewak, Manokwari and Sorong, uh, but they were isolated by, um, by the advances the, uh, the Allies did. So in, uh, in April he went to Aitape and, and Hollandia, and in May he went to Wakte and to uh, Biak. Uh, and from that moment on they tried to cut off the Japanese supplies coming from uh, the Molukkas to the, uh, the left of the picture uh, and, and the bottom left and bottom of the picture and by flying patrols around uh, the Bird's Head Peninsula, which is the, um, uh, well, you can see the, the, the most uh, western part of, uh, of the Dutch New Guinea. There were two Dutch squadrons involved in this, uh, in this battle, uh, 120 squadron flying P-40s uh, with Australian ground crew from uh, Merauke in the south, and uh, 18 squadron flying B-25s from uh, Bachelor. Uh, in Australia, mostly against uh, Timor and uh, the Moluccas and, uh, and New Guinea. I won't go into that further. There was a, a bit more of Dutch support, although there were not many forces that could have, uh, that, that, that did flee from, uh, from Java when it fell in, uh, in March 1942. There were some Dutch commandos, um, you see a picture on the right, fighting in the inland in, uh, in New Guinea. There were a number of Dutch submarines operating from uh, Fremantle or from um, Colombo in Salon. Um, there was a Dutch civil administration, just like the Australian Angau, who uh, went in after the Allied troops liberated um, parts of the Dutch East Indies and gave uh, support to the population. And I think the, uh, the biggest um, uh, support we gave the Allied cause was our um, merchant shipping. There were a fair number of Dutch uh, freighters that escaped from Indonesia, the KPM, the Koninklijke Pakketvaartmaatschappij, and they supported uh, MacArthur's advance in 1943, Operation Lilliput, 
from Milne Bay to, uh, to Ley and a number of Dutch ships were sunk there. Um, well, I was telling you in the beginning that I worked in the 1990s in the Dutch Air Force Museum. And in 1993, uh, the man in the, in the center of the picture, Max Ammer, walked into my office and told me he could help us find planes in New Guinea. It was a bit of a, a fantastic story. Um, he was sent away by other museums uh, because they didn't believe his story. But he was a very adventurous man. He just bought a ticket to, uh, to New Guinea. It was called uh, Irian Jaya then by the Indonesians uh, and went out searching for aircraft. And he, he did find aircraft wrecks. So he, he brought pictures, showed me pictures. And we um, started a project uh, in which I did the uh, archival research in uh, the Netherlands archives for Dutch planes lost over New Guinea. Uh, like the two pilots on, on the left who lost their P-40s uh, ditched off, uh, off Manokwari. Um, and Max, I sent those uh, uh, planes and their locations to Max and he just jumped on a, a motorbike and went there or uh, flew in by plane or just walked there. In 1995, he had uh, moved to, uh, to New Guinea, to uh, the Raja Ampat Islands. He started a, a diving resort there, which he still does, and a very successful one. Uh, so we had a perfect cooperation. I sent in the, um, all the details and he went out in the field to look for them. But the problem was that most of the Dutch planes lost um, were either completely uh, destroyed on, uh, on, on the crash landing or the pilot bailed out and the plane crashed into the ground or uh, like the P-40 on the, uh, the bottom left, uh, the bottom right, sorry, um, which was landed in a mangrove swamp. And well, the only recognizable thing left is the, uh, the Ellison engine. Um, so we, we, it didn't really work out. And then Max told me about uh, an American P-40 that had uh, ditched in Lake Sentani. Uh, lake Sentani is a huge freshwater lake uh, near Hollandia, the, the former Dutch capital of Dutch East Indies, now called uh, Jayapura uh, in Indonesian Papua. Um, and the, uh, the P-40 was of exactly the same make and model as the, the Dutch used, the P-40N. Um, and it seemed to be in very, very good condition. Uh, the, all the paint was still on it. The name of the pilot uh, hole could be read on, on the side of the cockpit. Um, and uh, the biggest, biggest uh, advantage of Lake Sentani is that it's a freshwater lake um, and there is a huge layer of, of dead water plants, like, like a silt laying over all the, uh, um, over the plain. So it was completely covered from, from oxygen and there was hardly any corrosion on the, on the plain. So in 1999, we decided on an, uh, an expedition to go there from the Air Force Museum together with our colleagues from the Aviodome Museum. And um, uh, the boss of our expedition was a former Dutch Air Force colonel uh, who was born in, uh, in Surabaya, who uh, who's, who's speaking Bahasa very well, uh, and who has the, um, the military authority or the military bearings to uh, to impress the Indonesians in helping us. We, we got permission from the Indonesian Air Force to uh, to do a, a reconnaissance of the lake and if possible to recover the, the plane. We found it the very first day and it was ideally located just 25 meters from shore, uh, five meters deep in excellent condition. Um, the airfield is well maybe a kilometer away. The main uh, highway uh, is also maybe a kilometer away and then it's about 50 kilometers to the docks in, uh, in Jayapura. So the possibilities of recovering this aircraft were excellent and we decided on doing that later that year or the next year. But it was on day one of our 21 day's journey there so we used the the rest of the time to search for aircraft and we found 17 wrecks in uh, in lake sentani 
um, among them a, a fairly good preserved uh, A-20 uh, Havoc or Boston bomber, a Japanese Ki-21 two-engine bomber, uh, Japanese uh, Vol uh, dive bomber, uh, Oscar fighter, a Tony fighter, uh, and of course completely burned and smashed other planes. But in, in um, well, uh, let's say 18, 20 days, we found 17 wrecks, so not too bad. But the moment we returned to Holland, the, the Dutch and the Indonesians uh, fell out over um, development support, I think, something like, like that it was. And the Indonesians withdrew the permission to recover the, uh, the P-40, so the project ended there. We got a new director in the museum. I left the museum to do other work, and the whole project died, unfortunately. But like I told you, in 2015, I started working uh, my own company, and I um, uh, made sure that I had some time to do my own research. I'd kept in touch with uh, Max in his diving resort and with some other guys from the, uh, the 1999 expedition. And together with Max, we decided to focus on um, airplane crashes near his resort. That would be much easier to, um, to go there and, and look if there was really something. Uh, and eventually, if we found a, a suitable plane to, uh, to see if we could uh, recover it. Uh, Max is um, having ideas about a, a museum for years now in, uh, in New Guinea. So um, maybe we could find a plane that is suitable for the uh, museum. So in that uh, process, uh, I started looking into uh, lost airplanes over the Vogelkop uh, area um, in, of course, the archives, Dutch archives, US archives, Australian archives. And we were helped by several people, and one of them, a Polish guy, Marek Katerinsk, um, who is uh, always traveling around uh, Indonesia to see if he can find uh, airplane wrecks. And we found about 40 of them, or not, not really found the wrecks, but I had a list of 40 uh, possible um, uh, planes. Many more were lost, of course, but these 40 uh, made uh, emergency landings or ditching in shallow water or, um, well, they, they had, were promising uh, from, from a perspective of finding them. Um, one of the interesting areas we were looking into were two Japanese airfields, or, or uh, three, Sagan, Otaviri, and Mongosha, were satellite fields from the, the big Japanese airfield at Babo. But Sagan and Otaviri are interesting because they were not reused after the war uh, for civil aviation. And they are still lay, laying there in the Bomberay Peninsula, uh, more or less untouched. And you can see from the pictures that Marek took in 2012, that you can see Japanese staff car and uh, a Japanese, um, what's, what's it called, a grader or a, a steam, um, what, what wij stoomwals uh, zouden noemen. Um, and he had many more of these pictures. So that was also an interesting um, location to, uh, to go to. And then I ran into this story. So, and after this, uh, a bit long introduction, we're coming to the, B, the B-25. Uh, the story of a, a B-25H that was lost over the Vogelkop. Uh, it was supposed to have made a, a crash landing and there were some uh, reports mentioning the crew being rescued. Um, when I uh, did more research on the, um, on, on the plane, it became more and more interesting. It was operated by a more or less obscure uh, squadron, the 418th Night Fighter Squadron, uh, which wasn't <laughs> light or medium bomber squadrons. It wasn't from one of the more famous uh, fighter squadrons with uh, aces like uh, Bong and Maguire. Um, they had flown P-70 night fighters, the, uh, the, the Boston, uh, A-20 Boston variant of the, uh, the light bomber uh, from 1943 in Port Moresby and Nutsup. 
Um, they were in the process in May, June 1944 in going over to the P-61, the Black Widows. Um, even a uh, consignment of P-61s had already arrived uh, with you in Brisbane. Uh, and a party of the squadron was sent there to, uh, to assemble them and fly them back to, uh, to New Guinea. But in the meanwhile, the squadron um, got assigned a number of, uh, of old hand-me-down and wary uh, P-25Hs uh, with the 75mm uh, cannon removed and were ordered to use these in anti-shipping missions, which is, of course, completely different from the, uh, the night fighter or the intruder missions that the, uh, the 418th flew before that. Um, the squadron was based at uh, Hollandia, but they had the uh, Wachte Airdrome as a forward base. And uh, on the 27th of July 1944, four of these uh, planes were ordered to do an anti-shipping um, mission flying around the uh, Vogelkop Island and see if they could find Japanese barges to, uh, to bomb. Um, the crew is a four-man crew. Uh, it's interesting to see if I go back to the, uh, to the B-25s. Um, it was the H variant. The, the B-25 is, of course, not very um, rare. Uh, even nowadays, there, there are a number of B-25s in the world. Um, we would have perhaps been more happy to have a, a P-61, a Black Widow there, flying in the, in the swamp in New Guinea, but it was a B-25H. But it's interesting because it's uh, a modified um, a version without a top turret with a 75 millimeter cannon removed. So within the type of the B-25s, it is a, a fairly rare uh, model. Well, the, there's a four-man crew, uh, so a fifth um, gunner is missing. Pilot Ira M. Barnett, you can see he's the typical, uh, a little bit arrogant fighter pilot. Um, Tom Wright, the navigator. Uh, Peter P. Whipland, the, uh, the radio operator and also air gunner. And a very interesting and colorful figure, Harold Tentaquidgen, uh, a full-blown Native American uh, who was the, uh, uh, the tail gunner of the, of the bomber. And Harold is interesting because he was 44 years old at that moment, uh, which was ancient, which was very old for a combat uh, position, and especially in New Guinea. But he really, really tried hard and succeeded in getting posted to a, uh, to a combat squadron. And um, so... That, that, that was a bit weird, but it was a, a colorful um, crew. Harold always took uh, extra uh, food and, and supplies and stores with him when they were flying, and the, old, the others were always deriding him for weighing down the plane with extra stuff, but this time they were happy he did it. But uh, the, the morning of the 27th, they flew from uh, Wakti, you see on the far right, between Biak and Japan uh, Island, um, over the Gilving Bay, and then they tried to, uh, to, to fly over the, um, the neck of, of the bird's head um, between the Japanese airfields of Mumi, Waren and Babo. The Japanese Air Force was, uh, was taken out. There was not much danger of, of encountering Japanese uh, Oscars or uh, Tonys. Uh, but the anti-aircraft guns at those air bases were still dangerous, so they kept well away of, uh, of the guns. Uh, over the Gilving Bay, they split up in, in two pairs of two B-25s, and one flew around the north and the other around the south, trying to, uh, to find barges coming in from the Moluccas to supply Babo and Sorong and along the north coast to, uh, to Manukwari. Uh, finally, they met up uh, in the area just south of Sorong, in the mouth of the Barur River, and they um, found a barge there. Ira Barnett was the first uh, to see the barge, and he warned the others, and they formed an attack pattern to, uh, to dive in and, uh, and attack the barge. But because of the maneuvering, uh, Barnett, although he was the first to, to spot the barge, was the last in the, uh, in, of the four planes in the attack pattern. 
and he made a slight mistake in in attacking it this is of course not a picture of the actual uh, attack but it must have been something like this uh, he was flying in very low over the water but he was flying a bit too low so he couldn't depress his nose enough to fire his um, his machine guns at the, the japanese gunners uh, and thus the japanese gunners were able to shoot back and they hit him in his uh, his left engine when flying over the uh, the barge he succeeded in hitting it with a uh, 100 pound uh, demo demolition bomb not a very heavy one um, but he was hit in um, in his left engine as i told you um, he was also hit in rudder cables and he was flying very low so uh, he immediately tried to gain height uh, he dropped the rest of his bombs um, they, they dropped all kind of other stuff from the plane which they didn't need to make it as light as possible and then he tried to fly back to um, to his base in Wagde or uh, to uh, to Biak if um, if he couldn't make uh, Wagde well, this is uh, the, the, an artist impression by a Polish aviation artist um, uh, of the, the, the last seconds of, of the flight because when he was flying back he, he was losing height and it was clear he couldn't make um, uh, an allied base in time and he had to do an emergency landing. They thought about uh, jumping out by parachute but that would have been very foolish because all the four crew members would have been I think lost in the jungle they would have been separated from each other wouldn't have the plane as, as a base um, to, to live on and have all the other stuff in the plane uh, and they were, couldn't probably be found anymore by uh, by their own um, uh, side so Barnett decided to um, to do a, a crash landing or maybe even a, a better a, a ditching in what he thought to be a, a, a grass area, and which turned out to be a huge swamp. Um, well, he, he made a, a successful landing, but on the last stretch of the landing, they hit a tree. Uh, you can see the tree standing in, uh, in the middle. Um, the plane swung around, uh, the fuselage broke, and both Harold Tentoquidgeon and uh, Peter Whipland were thrown from the plane. And Peter was um, cut up by the sharp aluminium um, and had a fairly severe wound in his uh, upper leg. Uh, one of his squadron mates was flying with him, so he warned the uh, Fifth Air Force in uh, Hollandia, and, and I think the, the main HQ was then in Natsap, uh, that one of the planes was down. But it was in the interior of, of New Guinea. It was not on, on the coastline, it was not in the water. So they couldn't send in a Catalina of the emergency rescue squadrons to, uh, to bring out the, um, the four men crew. Um, his squadron mate uh, circled over the, over the plane and he saw all four crew members uh, on the wings and on the fuselage. So they knew all four had survived. <coughs> but what to do? That was the the most important question. They were about 60 kilometers from uh, McClure Gulf, from, uh, from the shore, and it would have been impossible for them, uh, for the crew to march there, uh, even without uh, Pete Whipland's uh, injured leg. Uh, they had no experience in the jungle, and 60 kilometers is, is a very, very long track uh, to make. Uh, and there were Japanese around them, there were Papuans, of whom they didn't know if the, they were friendly or, or enemy. So they decided to uh, order them to sit tight, stay with the plane and um, to uh, uh, make a rescue team, to, to compose a rescue team. This picture was uh, then taken by uh, um, the 25th Photographic Reconnaissance Squadron. Uh, Staff Sergeant Charlie Crow went in Catalina and they took a lot of pictures of the area. They dropped a note with the crew, uh, which I will show you later, uh, saying, we know where you are. We have a combat photographer with us who's taking pictures of you, of the position of the surrounding area, and this will help the rescue team find you. Um, unfortunately, this is the only picture I have 
of that series that must have been taken and it's too zoomed in to exactly see where it is there's only some uh, more or less circumstantial evidence to see it's in an open area you can make your calculations that the uh, the area behind the plane is two three hundred meters of open area uh, but there's no um, I cannot fix it on uh, on on the river where it must be near to or any other features that might help us find the plane. Uh, then the rescue team was uh, was composed. Um, it took a few days uh, because it was in in Dutch New Guinea, so formally on Dutch territory, uh, and the the Papuans possibly could be friendly. They asked uh, the Dutch to to uh, help out in that respect, and um, the Dutch sent in uh, Lieutenant Louis Rachman, who is on the uh, on the the right, the lower picture, um, who done already done a lot of work for the U.S. Air Force uh, behind Japanese lines, <laughs> talking to the locals, uh, do reconnaissance with the Alamo scouts of the Sixth Army. Um, Rachman, who was born in uh, in Java. Um, and who'd worked as a photographer for the Dutch Navy in London in 1943, was then sent to Australia and to New Guinea and uh, promoted to, uh, to a lieutenant in the Dutch intelligence service, the NAVIS. Um, so Rapman uh, from Hollandia went up to Biak, took with him uh, six uh, Dutch Indonesian KNIL soldiers, uh, Netherlands East Indies Army soldiers as translators and, and guides. Um, but they didn't have real jungle expertise with them for this area. So they asked the, the Australian Army to help out. And the Australians had just started a jungle training school for the, uh, for the US 5th Air Force, uh, the Jungle Training Detachment, which was commanded by a Captain William Gillespie. And Gillespie, together with uh, three NCOs, uh, was flown from Natsap to, uh, to Biak and joined the team. Uh, there was also a survival specialist from the 5th Air Force, Donald Prickner. Uh, there were a few radio operators. Um, but Rapmund found that he it was a bit vulnerable. They were going in 300 kilometers behind enemy lines. Uh, the Japanese had a big garrison at Sorong at the, the, the far left of the Vogelkop in the south in Babo, that's not marked here, but it's just on the south of uh, McClure Gulf. And there were numerous smaller Japanese detachments all over the Vogelkop, plus the survivors from all the Japanese barges that were sunk, including uh, the one sunk by Barnett himself. And they knew, although these guys wouldn't be heavily armed, they sure were uh, angry and pissed off. So, <laughs> uh, if they could uh, capture or even kill uh, a U.S. air crew, they uh, they wouldn't hesitate to do that. So, Rapmund um, asked the, the Americans from some for some extra fire support, and uh, the general of the 41st Infantry Division, uh, General Jens Doe, asked for volunteers in the division that had been fighting uh, in Biak, and he got. 400 volunteers and from those 400 he, he picked uh, first 10 and later another eight uh, from an anti-tank company um, and they came uh, into the rescue team they brought with them some extra firepower uh, light machine guns their rifles hand grenades uh, tommy guns uh, and combat experience so Rapmund set out with a team of uh, almost 20 men in in catalina and they were flown into the uh, the mouth of the Kais River, uh, and something like the picture in the center, which is not from this uh, um, expedition, but it must have been something similar. They were bringing in both troops and supplies. Rabmund arranged for canoes from the local Papua tribes who were friendly with rowers, and the picture on the top right is taken by Rabmund himself. is from his uh, his personal collection. Well, then they set out from the uh, from the McClure Gulf, from the, the mouth of the Kais River, and they all canoed up the Kais. 
till the, um, the place where X uh, marks the spot, which is Kampung Baru. Kampung is a village in Indonesian, in Malay. Um, and Rapmun decided to make a base camp there. There were numerous Japanese reported. There were 150 at the uh, Cape Winsup from one of the ships that was sunk. There were 90 in uh, Tamin Bua, just to the north. There were 50 at Inan Watan, to the south. And certainly all these Japanese would hear about big white fellers uh, going into the jungle. Um, maybe they heard about the plane crash. So they would certainly um, going in to investigate and uh, finding out if there were allies, they would uh, attack those, those allies. So Rabmund set up a base camp in Baru. So he was sure that he could defend that place and then a, a smaller uh, rescue team split off and went onwards over the Sigi River to try and find the plane. Uh, he sent out uh, Captain Gillespie and his Australians together with a, uh, a local um, um, civil servant, a, a Indonesian civil servant who worked for the Dutch before the war, who knew the area very well, um, uh, knew the local population. Uh, he was sent with Gillespie and his team as a, as a scout. And he also took uh, two uh, Indonesian soldiers and, of course, uh, uh, about 10 canoes, yeah, there were 10 canoes, so there were a lot of Papua rowers in them as well. And they set out over the Sigi River for another 30 kilometers um, as the crow flies to the circle with the X where they suspected the plane had, uh, had landed. The moment they left, Baru, uh, Rachmund heard about Japanese coming in from the south over the Kais and Japanese coming in from the north. So together with uh, Sergeant Krause of the 41st Infantry, he set up ambushes um, to try and surprise the Japanese. That succeeded very well. What, what he did is he called out to the, um, or he sent out uh, one of the local Papuas uh, by canoe to both Japanese forces to advise the, the Papua rowers in those canoes to slightly separate the canoes in, in the Japanese convoy. So the Japanese canoes would arrive one at a time and not all together. Um, and that would give Rapmund and the, uh, the American infantry the chance to capture the Japanese or kill them. And that's what happened. Uh, the Japanese were either uh, captured as uh, all the canoes arrived separately or um, at one time, the Japanese didn't want to surrender, and Rapmund uh, shouted to the Papua rowers in uh, Malay, dive overboard. The Japanese didn't understand, and they stayed sitting in the canoe while all the Papuas dived overboard, and then the uh, Krause and his uh, machine guns opened fire and, and killed all the Japanese in the, uh, in the canoes. They took a number of prisoners, and that's something a, a bit later in this, uh, in this story. Gillespie... Uh, set out over the over the Sigi River, and um, well, you see from from the picture on the on the right that it's a picture taken of a supply drop over the uh, crashed uh, um, Mitchell. Um, unfortunately, it is a, a picture in the American archives, which was photocopied and then digitized, so the quality is is very bad. And maybe it is one of the um, uh, documents that was lost in the, the big fire at uh, the US Air Force History Department in the 1970s. Um, I haven't been able to find a, a better quality picture, but it really shows you the, uh, the area of, of swamps and water and, and marshes that the uh, supplies were dropped in. One of the supply drops dropped 300 meters from uh, the plane which is not very far, but it took them two hours to get there and back to retrieve the, um, the supplies. Well, I told you the, uh, um, the, the, the squadron members of the 418th dropped notes in the uh, Mohegan Tribe Museum in, uh, um, in the US. The note is preserved, so you can see here which says operations are in swing to get you out. We have a comrade cameraman is taking pictures of you, your position and your surrounding terrain. Um, and all 
kinds of instructions to show if they were uh, wounded or not. The uh, second emergency rescue squadron flying Catalinas for the, uh, the US Air Force uh, was doing that, that work. And in the, um, the website PBY Rescue from Jim Teagarden, uh, there are hundreds, really maybe thousands of pictures of operations of the, the, the second emergency squadron uh, during the whole of the war. But I ran into the, the center and, and the right picture at a certain moment, and I thought, well, this is not from this operation, is it? And I saw who took the pictures, uh, a certain lieutenant, and I knew he was flying the Catalina at that time. Um, because uh, the Jap there were a number of Japanese captured as prisoners of war, and they were flown out to Biak by the Catalina, which it took off from the Kais River, a very dangerous uh, takeoff. Um, and during the flight, one of the Japanese prisoners tried to uh, overpower a guard and to capture the plane. Uh, he was shot dead and he was thrown overboard from, from the blister. Uh, so while four took off, only three arrived in Biak, as you can see on the, on the picture on the, on the right. So I found it very interesting to find these pictures in that huge collection of pictures of um, Jim Teagarden. Well, finally, uh, Gillespie and his men found uh, the crew in the swamp, which is a story in itself. It took them about a week to get from Kampung Baru to the location uh, of the plane, slogging through the, through the swamp, um, going the wrong direction, returning to the river, camping out again, camping in that horrible swamp with its millions of mosquitoes and, and leeches. Uh, um, yeah, it must really have been horrible. At a certain point, I found um, uh, the crew. Uh, Gillespie unfortunately didn't bring his, uh, his whiskey. He was uh, born in Scotland. Uh, uh, and his daughter told told me uh, he liked a wee dram, um, so he couldn't uh, could only serve uh, tea. Uh, they had tea with him. So in the description of uh, finding the crew, it is recorded that they brew some tea and drank tea with uh, with the four man crew. And then again, it took took him one and a half day to get back to the uh, to the Sigi River, and then sailing down the Sigi River to the Kais and to Baru another two days. Um, and when they arrived in Baru, there was, of course, uh, a lot of uh, festivities and they were welcomed and uh, the commander of the 418th uh, uh, was there. Um, and there was a Catalina in the Kais River to fly him back. And this is uh, a picture taken, I don't know by whom, but it's from the collection of, uh, uh, of Tom Wright, the navigator. Um, and there you see the, the crew sailing to the, uh, to the Catalina to be flown back to, uh, to Biak. So all well ends well, uh, none of the crew died, none of the rescue team died, none of the Papuas died only, or not only, but um, uh, only in the Japanese forces, there were uh, numerous uh, losses. So a very successful three week operation far behind uh, enemy lines. So of course this this was very interesting for us to uh, to try and see if we could find this uh, the wreck of this plane. It was landed fairly intact, um, and in in a not very well um, uh, a very remote area. Not very many Papas live there. I had maps of the area. You can see the the Bavafana village uh, where we know possibly the uh, the B twenty five was in. So together with Max, we put together a, uh, an expedition of our own. Uh, he has his diving resort. He has his uh, powerful motorboats. Uh, he has local knowledge. So we took one of his seven meter boats and sailed it uh, from uh, the Raja Ampat to the mouth of the Kais River. Uh, we flew in to Inan Watan um, and then took the boat and sailed up the Kais and the, and the Sigi River camping out uh, on the shores of the uh, of the Kais. This was our last camp, Camp uh, Kowaffe, and this is also incidentally the, the village where the crew arrived when they came from the swamp and uh, were brought with the uh, uh, canoes to uh, Kampung Baru. 
uh, and the plane must be somewhere in the uh, in the background uh, to, to the left. Uh, the next morning, we uh, we sailed somewhat to the to the left, a couple of hundred meters, and started our walk into the swamp. But where to look? That's 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 the main problem we had. Um, I had the picture uh, taken by Charlie Crow in 1944. Um, I had an incidentally a, 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 an aerial taken in 27 January 1945, so exactly half a month, uh, half a year after the uh, the crash landing, which is in the huge aerial collection in a Dutch museum. So it was not very far from from my hometown. And it's the only photo run that's done over this area. There's nothing of any interest, military or civilian or strategic or whatsoever in the area. So no idea why they did this photo run half a year after the crash, but it was photographed. Uh, and there are fortunately enough uh, uh, high-resolution satellite pictures of the uh, area, which are not very expensive, only uh, 40 euros per, per picture with a 30 centimeter resolution, so you can zoom in uh, effectively. But where to look? We know it must have landed in an open area. There are a few open areas. You can um, combine that with the information from the actual picture. You know from the picture of 1945 how much the the, the area has changed, which isn't much. Uh, and we thought it the plane must be in the area around a small lake here in the center. Um, well, we went into the swamp and you can see what happens. In all the pictures, we're looking at our feet. We're not looking in the jungle or in the swamp because you're trying not to fall off the trees or to drown in the swamp or to hit uh, the needle sharp sago tree thorns. Um, you're... So a plane can be an arm's length away and you won't see it. So it was a more or less futile endeavor to, to walk in the, uh, in the swamp uh, as uh, desk jockeys and try and find uh, the plane without real knowledge. There were a, a number of Papuas with us who helped us uh they hadn't seen the plane wreck themselves but their fathers had seen them had seen it and they knew approximately where to go uh, but even then it was difficult for us to uh, to find it and and we didn't succeed we were a full day in the swamp and we came out with the idea that it's useless uh, there's no use of doing it another day um, we either asked the papas to to try and find the plane, uh, or we have to do it with some more sophisticated equipment like a magnetometer, metal detectors, um, uh, infrared or LIDAR images or whatever. Uh, going in without any extra knowledge is useless. But one of the interesting things was that the I, I took this group picture, uh, had it, I had it with me sealed in against the humidity, and I showed it to the to the local Papuas. They immediately recognized the building in the background. They said, "Hey, this is the church in Kampung Baru, and it is still there. So maybe you should go there." Um, well, the picture itself is interesting. I got it from the daughter of Louis Rabmund, who lives in Las Vegas. Um, when she sent it to me, she thought it was a picture of her father on the on the far right, the, the, the small guy on the far right together with uh, American Alamo scouts or whatsoever. But when I started studying the picture, I of course immediately noticed the Australian, the tall Australian besides Louis with his slouch hat. Um, and I recognized the American uniforms, but then I noticed the, the guy in the center with a, uh, a gash in his trouser and probably some white bandages underneath. And the other one with uh, a piece of rope uh, tying his trousers and the guy with the, the pilot uh, because you faintly see some uh, pilot wings um, he has a, a torn knee so I thought this these must be the the air crew 
Uh, finally, I found the uh, the cousin of uh, Harold Tantequidgen in the in Mogan Museum, um, and and she recognized Harold as uh, the guy on uh, on the far left with the uh, U.S. cavalry uh, hat, which he was always uh, wearing. Um, so I knew this was the the rescue team. And then we went into uh, uh, Kampung Baru on a Sunday. There was a church service, and Max was allowed tell the congregation what we were doing there and during him telling what we were doing uh, a young woman walked out and we found that strange why would she walk out uh, of the church but when we came out she'd brought her grandfather because she'd recognized the story and she recognized her grandfather in the picture so this is paulus he was 13 14 years old then and he's now a, a, a 90 plus years old uh, Papua, which is exceptional because most of these people won't get much older than 55 years old. Um, so he, he'd been the last survivor of the, of the rescue mission, uh, probably. Um, he was a bit confused. He was deaf. Uh, he did speak a few Dutch words to us, but he couldn't help us in any way uh, find a plane. But still, it was a bit of a cherry on the pie to find the uh, Paulus while we couldn't find uh, the wreck of the plane and uh, we thanked him for his uh, for his service. I took of course a picture of me with Louis Rappmund on, on the picture in front of, uh, of the church. Uh, Louis was incidentally uh, tragically murdered in October 1945 in Java while he uh, was on his way to be reunited with his family and during the Indonesian revolt he was uh, murdered by uh, probably a, a gang of thugs not not really Indonesian soldiers um, so well we we ended this part of the expedition and we tried to to go to uh, the Sagan airfield we sailed down uh, the Kais river again we camped in a horrible area which resembles a world war one trench uh, frontline area <laughs> it was really really horrible uh, night sleeping there and the next day we we crossed the uh, McClure Gulf but some of the guys in the group uh, got uh, medical problems and we had to end the expedition in uh, in Kokas we then flew back to uh, Storum um, and together with one of the guys Fred I went to Sansapur we found uh, the wreck of this uh, B-25 Little Miss Fuzz, which has still seven crew members uh, inside. We found on the invasion beaches at Sansapur uh, a number of alligators, uh, amphibious uh, uh, tanks still standing there. And together with Henk, another Dutchman in the uh, resort, in Marx's resort, I found this wreck of a B-25 near Samate, a Japanese uh, airfield. And then we went back to Max's resort, which wasn't a punishment. It wasn't very horrible there. Uh, we get some R&R for a couple of days before uh, uh, flying back to, uh, to Amsterdam. So there is a, uh, let's see if I can make this run, a short picture, uh, a video. flying into Inan Watan. Walking to the uh, to our boat. And then sailing up the Kais River, Max uh, operating the engines. Local people helping us find the right directions. Local people studying uh, the pictures I took with me. The local villages. This is our campsite at uh, Koafe with a swamp in the in the background.
the next day we uh, went into the swamp. And here Max told us not try to keep our feet dry. Well, you see, <laughs> that won't work. Leeches, heat, needle sharp thorns of the sago palms, extremely risky. In the evening, we discussed um, how the Papuas could help us find the wreck. And the next day we went to Kampung Baru, to the church, built in 1940 and still in use. Dutch Veterans Institute was our sponsor for the, uh, for the trip. Crossing McClure Gulf. Sailing into Kokas, where we uh, located the location of a Australian P-40 that uh, that ditched there. And then, together with uh, Fred Pelder, I went to uh, Sansapur, trying to find the wreck of Little Miss Fuzz. And here's the plane, here's the wreck. The alligators with their cargo uh, of forklifts still inside them. Incredible. All right. Uh, how do I advance? Ah. Yeah. So um, I'm coming to the end of the uh, of the presentation. We're now planning to go back in uh, 2021. We were planning to go this year, but of course, because of COVID, it's uh, it's impossible. Max has a Bell 47 helicopter at his resort flying uh, and he we're thinking about using that with a magnetometer to try and locate the wreck but hot of the of the press this morning Marek from Poland emailed me that he found the wreck he's in Poland and he's only using uh, the same uh, information I have aerials satellite pictures uh, reports things like that but um, well, I'm waiting for confirmation on that, but I'm uh, of course hopeful that he really has positive uh, um, um, evidence of, of the wreck at a certain position, which would make our endeavor much, much more easy. Uh, I, I'm still doing research. I've written a book about this, uh, this crash landing and the rescue. Um, I found the family of Captain Gillespie, which is here uh, on, on the right. His, his daughter is living uh, in Moss Vale, south of Sydney. Visitor, visited her last year. I found all the, the relatives of the crew members, but I'm still looking for uh, the Australian NCOs, their families, Riordan, Goddard and Scott, which is very difficult. Um, for the um, Americans, Brickner, Crow and Krause, 
uh, and for an Indonesian guy uh, Papre, who uh, was also involved in the uh, in the rescue. Um, but this is the book I wrote, Kais, uh, the true story of daring rescue of a bomber crew. And hopefully next year when we really find, locate the wreck, I can do uh, a follow up on this uh, story or an improved version with um, some pictures and the story of, uh, of the wreck we found. So well, this is the end of the uh, of my presentation. So I think I stopped the share. Yeah. Thanks very much, Baz. That was uh, very, very, very interesting. Um, you did a fantastic job at the start there, setting the scene for how the campaign in the Southwest Pacific sort of unwound against the Japanese. Um, loved your uh, pictures. There's a lot of photos there that I'd never seen before, and I've seen a lot of photos and some great artwork. Um, I was a bit gobsmacked when you said, oh, we found 17 wrecks at Lake Santani in 18 days, just like that. <laughs> How do you do that? Um, so yeah. yeah, what a fantastic adventure. So uh, I think, um, thank you very much. And we'll throw the floor open to, uh, to any questions. If anyone wants to ask a question, just hold your space bar down uh, and talk while the space bar is held down or unmute yourself. So over to, to, to the group. Silence. <laughs> I have one about the Catalina. Um, I put a photo up, sorry, put a um, question up before. The Catalina in the background that picked up the staff officer, I think, um, it looked like an early or PY5A or perhaps earlier. Do you know which, was that a US one or yep. any ideas? Yeah, you, you're not talking about the, the, the color picture. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I had the the, 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 yeah, the second of the, of the, of the crew yeah. members sailing to. Yeah, that, that's. That is a picture of the uh, the actual pickup, mm -hmm. um, and it was a Catalina of the Second Emergency Rescue Squadron. So it was mm -hmm. U.S. Army Air Force uh, yep. squadron flying Catalinas. Yeah. Okay, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Peter, I've got one. Uh, Baz, it's. Uh, Graham Aspinall from Townsville in North Queensland. Um, some time ago, about over 10 years ago, I visited a museum. I think it was, if I've got the pronunciation correct, uh, it was uh, a town called, is it Schusterberg? Mm-hmm, yeah. Is that the Dutch Air Force, Air Force Museum that you spoke about, Baz, or is that another museum? Uh, we, we had a Dutch... Air Force SUS Museum in Susterberg, which had both the Dutch Air Force, the Naval Air Service, and the Dutch East Indies Air Force in the collection. And that's uh, been merged with the Army Museum, and it's now the National Military Museum. It's also on Susterberg, but on the former Susterberg Air Base, uh, about two, three kilometers north of the, uh, the old. So I think you. 10 years or more ago, then you must have visited the old museum. I'd say so, yeah. There was only uh, aircraft that I, I recall visiting. So yeah, it's obviously there's been changes um, since I was last there for sure. Yeah, it, it is now uh, a very modern, uh, uh, very sleek museum. I'm missing a bit the, uh, the old atmosphere uh, of an, of an a real aviation museum and the army is a bit too powerful in my <laughs> opinion but okay. <laughs> uh, I can understand that yeah the yeah. the uh, aircraft that were on display they were very well preserved and restored so it did stick in my mind it was a it was a yeah. very enjoyable visit there I think we spent about the best part of a day there my friend and myself so it was a very memorable uh, visit to that particular museum yeah. Yeah, there were, uh, we had a number of interesting aircraft also from the from the Pacific, and one of the best is the Dornier 24 flying boat, which the Dutch Air Service, Naval Air Service, uh, yeah, used, yeah. and also was used in Australian service uh, because a number of these were flown from Java to uh, to Australia at the end of the uh, Java campaign, and a, a number of them were lost at Broome in uh, March 3rd, 1942. Yeah. Yeah. 
Raz, uh, yes. Peter Dunn here. I've got a question, or maybe two questions. Um, did you ha have a drone with you and use that at all to help try to search for the wreckage? Yeah, we, we had a drone and we tried to do that, um, but it also found out it, it, it is so difficult to find a, a wreck in a swamp, which is yeah. maybe 90, 95 percent submerged and the rest is yeah. overgrown. And trays uh, are Yep. Yeah, Max told me about uh, the P-38. M maybe you remember I started my talk with a picture of a P-38 in a swamp. Yep. Uh, that's a P-38 in New Britain. Um, and Max uh, found this P-38, but the moment he found it, he didn't know he was standing on top of it until one of the local people said, well, Max, you're standing really standing on top of the plane. <laughs> and it took him about a day to hack away all the... Yeah. Uh, the, the trees <laughs> and the plants to to get this picture. You didn't so, know it was there. Yep. No, so we we soon found out that the drone itself is useless. You you have to have something like a magnetometer, yeah, or a lidar or infrared yes. or whatever to Light, lidar would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that sort of work. Um, other question. I've uh, probably got another two actually. Uh, did you end up getting malaria? <laughs> No, no, no. Very lucky. But one of the yeah, one of the guys in, in the group was uh, not very careful in um, in tending to his very small, tiny wounds, yep. and they were all they they became infected. Okay. And we were very fortunate that both Max and Rob, is his business partner of the uh, the diving resort Papa Diving, they've been both the Dutch uh, special forces in their uh, where they were conscripted. And Rob has a lot of experience in bushwalking, and uh, he always told us where Betadine, and rub Betadine in always, every time, every moment you stop. Yeah, Betadine, 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 yep. and that worked. Very good, very good. <laughs> now the other thing I seem to recollect uh, was it you that mentioned you you were trying to get back to Australia for a project in Australia yep. at Broome, yep. I think it was, wasn't it? Tell us a bit about that, please. Yeah, well. Uh, incidentally, I now have two Australian projects. <laughs> uh, the one is uh, is Broome. Um, we were to go there last year with the Western Australia Wreck Museum in uh, in Fremantle uh, because they're doing a lot of uh, underwater archaeology on the, the Dutch VUC ships, the Batavia and the Duifken, uh, but also on uh, the Broome wrecks. There are 15 flying boats sunk there the top of my mind and there are still three of them missing they were trying to find these three and i was um, asked by the dutch uh, state heritage agency to accompany the western australian museum to do this but last year unfortunately it uh, uh, for some reason we, we couldn't go so we said well okay we go in 2020 <laughs> mm -hmm. but now yeah, the, the 2020 expedition is also cancelled of course and now we have it uh, scheduled for 2021 uh, very very interesting uh, uh, project that is and the second one you were talking about is the Camp Columbia uh, project uh, oh, together yeah, with the, uh, right. the University of Queensland um, uh, Professor Ian Lilly uh, he's been in touch and you were right about the uh, the correctional facility standing on top of the former headquarters yeah but it's 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 slightly off and uh, it's not the prison itself, so we're allowed to dig there. Oh, yeah? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, we're, we're probably trying to do some archaeological work uh, on site. So this uh, is out, for those year. listening, this is out of, near Waco, um, yeah. where Camp Columbia was, near the prison farm, let's say, or oh, it's not a farm, a prison. <laughs> Can I ask, why were the flying boats sunk at Broome? Um, well, there, there were uh, numerous flying boats at the February and March uh, flying out uh, the Dutch, but also uh, Australian and allied personnel from Java and, and families. And they, the shortest route was from Java to Broome. Uh, so they all landed in Broome to refuel and then fly south to Port Hedland or to uh, Perth. Um, and they thought they were out of range of the Japanese, but these had captured uh, the airfield at uh, Kupang in Timor. And from there, their uh, zero fighters could reach, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, 
could reach uh, Broome. Ah, uh, I thought Darwin was the only place that was bombed. My oh, father no, was no, in no. Darwin when it was bombed in 42. Uh, there's over 100 bombing raids in Australia. Yeah. So. They kept it very quiet at the time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, you, you can see the, the, the flying surprised. boats burning in Roebuck Bay. Yeah. yeah, but there were also U.S. flying boats and Qantas flying boats um, uh, set a fire during that uh, that raid. The raid on Broome. It wasn't only flying boats; also uh, land aircraft at the airport, yeah. and all the taking aircraft were just fighters, no bombers, and the fighters did a massive job on uh, devastating the. Tired aircraft on the water and on the land, and at very very low tides, you can just still see some of the flying boats in the water. Yeah. Wow! As you may or may not be aware, that uh, the only Japanese plane that was shot down was shot down by a Dutchman. <laughs> yeah, Gus Winkel. Yes, yes. Uh, of course. He, he was flying a transport, and he had a a single uh, machine gun. Uh, he he was just cleaning it. So he had it outside his, his plane and he took it in his hands. And uh, shot down one of the, uh, the Japanese fighters, thereby burning, uh, burning his hands. That one. And the other interesting thing is the, it's, it's also there, uh, Peter shows it, it's the, uh, the Dutch East Indies DC-3 that was shot down a little uh, north of Broome the same day by the same Japanese, Pelican. Yeah. And it had, a, 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 among others, a cargo of very wow. valuable diamonds yes. on board. <laughs> yes. uh, and it was flown by uh, Shmernov. Yeah, well. by a, a Russian World War I fighter ace who was flying for KLM and the, the Dutch East Indies Air, uh, Airlines. Gus Winkle also had the distinction of um, uh, bombing a Japanese submarine off the coast of Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah he yeah. is he's better known in Australia than he is in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> there is even a Gus Winkel street and there's even a statue of him somewhere in Australia, but uh, in Holland he's completely unknown. Well, the Peter's information here will confirm this, but I think it was a, a Qantas Empire flying boat also happened to be coming along at the wrong time and got shot down too, is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember. Could be. Is it in the list here? It is. Yeah, there it is at the top. Carina. Yeah, and, and one of the, the most, uh, the things they're very much looking for is the uh, American B-24, the Liberator, that was shot down with uh, about 30 personnel yeah, in them. Um, one of them swam back to shore, swimming for I think something like 30 hours and he survived. Um, but the, um, the, the American uh, DPAA, um, uh, they, they'd like to, to see if they could find this, uh, this plane and recover the remains of the, uh, the 30 uh, people on board, if, if they're still in the wreck, of course. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that's the end of my my two questions that became three questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, Baz, Joe Vella, yeah. um, you spoke about the extra food that the crew member carried on board as a as matter of routine. <laughs> How did that work out? Yeah, yeah. That it was that, that was that was really nice because uh, the others were grumbling about him taking all that stuff, and he also had a package of sandwiches. Uh, with him, and uh, when uh, the plane crashed, the sandwiches also flew from the wreck in the in the swamp. But later, he he more or less dived in the in the swamp to retrieve his sandwiches, not to eat them, but to use them as bait. They used them for fishing from uh, from sitting on top of the uh, of the plane. And Harold also made a, a more or less um, he lured in all the the frogs from the swamp. And then cut off their legs, and they breakfasted on uh, frog legs the next morning. So he was a very in in inventive uh, guy. Yeah. But they didn't have crocodiles in the swamp. No, uh, fortunately not. Not, but they were very much afraid of them. Of oh yes. Crocodiles. So they they stayed on the on on the wreck, and, and they, they were there was nowhere to go. I mean, uh, we walked there 
uh, and we did some 400 meters per hour. Uh, and, and Max yesterday told me he did once a swamp walk that took him two days to do, to do two kilometers. My so God. It's, it's really horrible, horrible terrain. Yeah. Um, so they were really stuck there. How long were they stuck there, Pat? Uh, three weeks. And were there any in interim airdrops made of food? Yeah, or anything yeah, to yeah, them? yeah, yeah, yeah. They had the first, first couple of days they had to, uh, to use the extra stores that uh, Harold took with him on board. And they were very, very happy that he took uh, a pineapples. He had some <laughs> beans, um, all, all kind of stuff that he really n normally didn't like. But at that time, uh, they were very happy to have. Right. Then they had the frog, frog legs, <laughs> frog and they were, of course, uh, fortunate that it rains a lot in that area. So they had enough uh, fresh water. They fresh water. didn't need to, uh, to drink uh, the swamp water, which would have made them very, very ill, I think. And then from the third day on, they were uh, supplied by their own squadron or the, uh, the Catalinas. And they even dropped magazines, books, because boredom was the worst enemy. Mm. Um, new uniforms, uh, some some rifles. Uh, so if radio? they were a few could... Sorry, did they, get a radio? did they get a radio? No, their their uh, Gibson girl was damaged in the in the crash landing in the ditching. Yeah. Um, no replacement. And fourteen days later, they dropped uh, uh, walkie talkies. Walkie -talkie? Yeah. They also dropped walkie talkies with the rescue team, so they could talk to each other. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But the the the, ding, the Gibson girl serviced them well because they used the balloon as a, uh, a, a recognizable feature. So they flew the balloon, which oh, is good. about 25 meters, I think, in height. It can reach with the antenna, um, which didn't work. But the rescue team saw the balloon flying oh. over the swamp and oh. knew where to find the, the crew. Oh. Yeah. A lot of aids helped them out a little bit here yeah. and there. Yeah, that's very good. Very good story. Very good story. <laughs> Any other questions for Baz? One more, Charles Page. Uh, Baz, uh, do you know of any records, uh, perhaps in the Netherlands, of uh, 19 Squadron that uh, was established uh, after the end of the war? Sure. Uh, that's a transport squadron, uh, I think. Um, yeah, there, there, there are there are uh, records of these in in the Hague uh, military history uh, uh, research department of the uh, armed forces. Uh, you you could reach out to them and they will gladly help you uh, with information. Can I ask the same question in relation to Squadron One Hundred and Twenty? Yeah, well, uh, One One Hundred and Twenty Squadron. Uh, I did a lot of research on that in the in the nineteen nineties. Um, yeah, their story is 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 very fairly, fairly well known. It was a, they called themselves uh, the 18th with the Mitchells. They called themselves the Forgotten Squadron, and the 120th they called themselves the Obscure Squadron. They were sitting the whole of 1943 in Merauke doing nothing, and only in the late summer of 1945 they were um, moved to Biak and did a, a couple of bombing attacks on Manokwari, losing a fair number of pilots there which was at that point in the war, of course, useless, but um, ex exactly like uh, a lot of Australian squadrons that still had to attack uh, Wewak and Rabal, which was useless, but which was dangerous. Yeah. My particular interest in Squadron 120 is in a guy by the name of uh, Bauer Prince, who was the aircraft me mechanic on the IFA. Yeah. Have you got any information on his activities in the Dutch New Guinea? Um, I think Prince was also the mechanic of the Uyver. Yeah, yeah he was. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So he was in the, the, the London-Melbourne race and yes. he was, I think, the maintenance officer for the squadron during the war. Um, I don't have any particular <laughs> information about him, but again, the, the, the um, uh, military history the department will gladly help you find uh, additional information about him if, if yes. they have it. Yes, I actually have his Amsterdam medal. Ah. Uh, like when I say I've got it, I've got it from his, his, his granddaughter has gifted it to the Albury Library Museum. Mm. 
uh, together with some other interesting uh, objects. Okay, nice. I'll I'll chat with you if I can offline sometime. Yeah, sure. Because I've had a lot of contact with Aviadrome. Okay, okay, great. Okay, any one last question for uh, Baz? Just one question from Joe in uh, Western Australia. The, in Solomons and places like that, the scrap dealers have been through and collected a lot of the aircraft wreckage. Do they have that problem in West Irian still? Um, no, no. Um, of course, sometimes uh, stuff is removed. Uh, but when we were in, in Cocos uh, last year, which is it, it, the interesting uh, little harbour where uh, the famous picture series Death of an A-20 uh, uh, originates. Uh, there were anti-aircraft guns on almost every street corner on the top of the hill. The command bunker was still there. Um, yeah, as long as it's not in, in somewhere in the way, they just leave it there. It's the, yeah, they don't particularly like it or value it, but yeah, it's just standing there. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, we might leave it at that. I think, um, thanks again, Baz, that was extremely interesting. Yeah. If we could just have a, a show of hands um, to thank <laughs> Baz for his uh, very interesting talk. Um, thank very you. Very nice for me to visit Brisbane this, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Well, it's this evening here. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay.